Welcome back, and thank you for joining us for episode 111, I believe it is. Uh, We're up to Exodus 20, I know. And Exodus 20, we mentioned yesterday, is kind of a famous chapter in which we God gives us, for the first time, the Ten Commandments. And even that is a little um, mysterious in the sense that there are, I believe, in Hebrew, 14 different command words that are used here. Mm -hmm. Um, And they aren't numbered. And that totally throws people off because Christians of different backgrounds will argue with one another about what is the, you know, fourth commandment and what is the fifth commandment. And they'll, you know, whether you come from a um, Orthodox background or a Catholic background or Baptist background or Lutheran background or... Mm -hmm. Or Jewish background, you'll number. Do you think there's two at the end for coveting, right? Nine and ten. <laughs> I do uh, number them the Lutheran, the traditional Lutheran way, as Saint, which, which is actually based on Saint Augustine's numbering. Well, right here it says you must not covet, yeah. and they put it all together. So I don't know. Well, yes. I always learned that was the tenth commandment: thou shalt not covet. Right, and I would say yes. The last of the commandments. Which are one coveting. do you cut out then? So where you would add that in is the you shall not make any graven image unto God. That's lie. No, no. Oh, I know. That's yes. What I thou shall have, yeah. Thou shall have no other gods before me. You would thou say that's the second. Yes. Any, any graven image. And we would say yeah, making a graven image is making an idol, oh. which is just an explanation of the first commandment. No, see, I think, in, but you, you, that's like yes. your favorite topic is idols. So you. <laughs> You, of all people, should know that that's not necessarily what he's talking about. And additionally, they had a specific problem with making graven images. Correct. So I feel like those, it makes more sense to separate those. Yeah, I also th- think that... Because um, what are the two covets? Your your neighbor's wife is one your wife? Yeah, it's actually more than just two things. It's a combination What of, do you say is nine and ten? Yeah, it's... Um, I, would, I have to... I, in my own head, I always just say nine and ten are coveting. It's like oh. your neighbor's wife and workers and cattle and money and all that stuff. Everything that belongs to your neighbor. Um, my The, the uh, explanation is like... It, the two are the same. It's yeah. the same concept. Mm-hmm. I, I'm misremembering right now. I think there might actually be two different Hebrew words used for oh. covet in those two things, mm-hmm. which is part of the reason for it. It doesn't matter that much. Like I said, there's actually 14 command words mm-hmm. here. And so being able to know what all of it says. There also is another, what you have to learn, we're getting into my points here a little bit, but you have to be able to separate the embedded principle from the application of the mm-hmm. principle here, which is why the numbering is even less relevant. Isn't it interesting that movies have been made about this? Uh, yes and no. You mean the like Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments yeah. and why that was such a biggest such a big grossing movie, movie of yeah. all time. Yeah, it was partially the the how grand it was done. It was mm-hmm. done on an enormous scale. It was an mm. extraordinarily expensive. It was done really well. But it was also something that was relevant to everyone's life. Like mm-hmm. we had uh, over half the world looks at those events as relevant to themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, whether you're Jewish or Islamic or oh, Christian, mm-hmm. like that is a huge part in your history to some extent. So... Um, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. It it doesn't surprise me that it would be such a big deal. In the same way that it doesn't surprise me that like Passion of the Christ was a huge yeah. deal too. Okay. People, even though faith tends to be underrepresented in Hollywood, when Hollywood does, which I'm surprised from a financial standpoint, it doesn't do it more. When Hollywood does dabble and do it well into biblical stuff, mm-hmm. there is an enormous amount of... Um, um, whatever you want to call it, audience for that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, significant enough event that of all the major Bible events, there will be one named after the Ten Commandments is is interesting in its own own right. Um, But anyways, um, let's make sure to read through your copy of Exodus 20 at home. Here's my personal paraphrase. Uh, God spoke to Israel and reminded them that he is the God who brought them out of slavery by grace. And then he gave them the Ten Commandments. That's an interesting order, which we'll touch on here in a minute. He started with the primary command, you shall have no other gods. That is the overarching command, idolatry, is the Mm -hmm. overarching command over all the other commands. Uh, From that extends not making graven images to God, not misusing God's name, not forgetting to honor a day for God for worship and rest. Then he moves, that's considered the first table of the law or the laws that govern our relationship with God. 
Then he moves on to laws that govern our interactions with other human beings, or the second table of the law. You mean? Do you mean tablet? Yeah, table is another word for tablet. Oh, okay. Um, I know we think of this as a table in, mm -hmm. today in modern language, but they're generally not referred to as the tablets of the law, but the tables of the law. Okay. Um, but yes, that they is were the on two different Moses holding. They were on yes. two different ones. Yes, correct. Um, How did God write them on? He etched them in, did Moses etch them or God? So God writes them oh. in, and later on Moses writes them down as well. But the mm -hmm. initial seeming of, mm -hmm. the initial giving of it seems mm -hmm. to be like God's finger in the stone kind of thing. Um, so the interactions are where we honor our parents and our authorities, that we not murder, uh, that we not steal, that we not lie, that we not even covet, which is a fascinating conception for modern Western people who don't believe that their desires can be wrong at all. They think their desires are just healthy functions of who they are, mm -hmm. you know, who they were designed to be. And they don't think that our internal wiring and our heart wiring can actually go haywire and be off. And so, but coveting, which is a, sounds like an old timey English word, is the concept of inappropriate desire. The people saw the thunder and lightning from God and asked only to speak to Moses from now on because they were so afraid. So like, yeah, Moses, you go talk to him and just let us know what he has to say. Uh, Moses encouraged them that this was a good thing because it helps deter them from sinning. Again, that healthy conception of a fear of God that we talked about yesterday. Moses then approached the darkness where God was and God again encouraged Moses not to allow the Israelites to make any false gods of silver or gold. Moses was to make an earthen altar before God to sacrifice offerings. And Moses' worship to God was supposed to be humble and respectful so that people would not get distracted. Uh, God even made sure that there were no steps so that no one would be exposed as they walked up to the altar. So like as they go to present an altar and whatever they were wearing at the time, apparently they didn't want anything being overexposed or falling out or hanging out or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an odd thing, but yet he's we, talking about the propriety and yeah, we prance up to the communion rails and everybody kneels down, regardless of if they're wearing a skirt, whatever. That is you a see everybody's butt. Well, no, that is a different. <laughs> no, you don't, and that's a that's a different topic. You the, see the everyone's point is that you're making, backside. I mean, yeah, that's not the issue. The issue is things being not covered the way they should. Which is sometimes to, things aren't covered the way they should be. Well, that's uh, that. Yes, and that is both an Old Testament and New Testament issue. The Apostle Paul talks to Timothy about the way both men and women dress, and it's, he never says you should always wear exactly this. But the concept of modesty mm -hmm. that is certainly there. But God is encouraging modesty because He doesn't want anything to take away from the propriety of mm -hmm. what's actually taking place. Um, so, all right, devotional thoughts for the day. Number one. Deliverance and then commands. It's an important order. Um, and it's important because uh, it shows us how gracious God is and how different he is from every other world religion. And so, for instance, every other world religion has the conception that you would do certain things, obey certain commands, and maybe then your God will love, accept, and bless you. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, you, you eightfold path of enlightenment, five pillars and tenets, uh, that kind of thing. But the Israelites are a little bit different in that you notice God doesn't say, okay, I'm gonna give you the 10 commandments. And then he sends Moses with the 10 commandments to the Israelites in Egypt in slavery and say, okay, guys, obey these commandments and then God will free you from slavery. Mm -hmm. That's not the order. He miraculously, graciously, undeservedly delivers them from slavery, passes them through water, and then he sends them to Mount Sinai to get the commandments. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're not supposed to obey the commandments so that God will deliver them. They're supposed to obey the commandments mm -hmm. because God has already delivered them. And remember, as we look through Exodus and how this mirrors the life of a believer, people who were enslaved by sin, who passed through water and became God's people, who are then taken to Mount Sinai and said, okay, live this way. We're not living to get a verdict, a positive verdict from God. We're living out of the positive verdict that we've already gotten from God in Christ. And that concept of deliverance then uh, commands as mm -hmm. opposed to the, every other world religion commands then you know deliverance which is essentially just a meritocracy you have to earn your grace you have to earn your favor and acceptance and love 
Uh, whereas in Christianity, it's free, it's grace, it's undeserved and unmerited. And that's what, that's what makes Christianity so unique. Mm-hmm. So um, the, make sure you understand the order there. God doesn't command his people and then they obey and then he delivers them. He delivers them freely, even though they haven't done one thing to deserve it. And then he encourages them to live thankfully and in obedience to him and his commands because it's for their good and for a way to say thank you to him for the free deliverance. Mm -hmm. Devotional thought number two. Uh, The commandments contain a principle and an application. This is, you know, I just haven't heard a lot of Christians or even like pastors necessarily talk like this before, but the distinction, so like you get to the, what I would number and Luther and Augustine would number, yeah, okay. I want, you're you're getting a little too. These are your the way you number these things. <laughs> um, so when you get to like the third commandment, mm-hmm. and it says, "Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy," a New Testament believer is like, "What am I supposed to do with that?" Yeah, because like, what do we have a Sabbath day? And therefore, the error that some Christians make is they they talk as though we live under the ceremonial laws, mm-hmm. and like. New Testament Christians don't technically have a Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want to give that insinuation. The idea that you would... The the principles of the Sabbath are good and important, Mm -hmm. but we don't live under... We don't... There isn't like a certain amount of steps that we're allowed to take and we're not allowed to do certain... There's like more freedom than that. And in fact, in Colossians 2, the Apostle Paul says, don't let anybody judge you by festivals or new moon celebrations or Sabbath regulations or anything like that Mm -hmm. and so what we have to do is you have to sort of distill uh you have to figure out what's the embedded principle in each command and what is specifically just an application for the israelites at that time that god is giving to them Mm -hmm. so for instance uh the principle that god is attaching to the third commandment remember the sabbath day by keeping whole keeping it holy is i want you to stay in my word and in worship with god's people Okay, so be with God's people Mm -hmm. in God's word and dedicate time. Uh, Specifically, I'm going to give you a day a week to do that, to rest your bodies and find rest for your souls as you hear my promises reiterated to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the conception of worship. Now, that was, there's all sorts of other regulations attached to that day for the Israelites, but the general principle of staying in God's word with God's people remains today. It's one of the reasons why the writer to the Hebrews, remember the Hebrews in the New Testament are Jews who converted to Christianity. Mm-hmm. And in chapter 10, he says, let us not give, give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing and all the more as we see the day approaching. Why were they giving up meeting together? Because mm-hmm. they thought, well, we don't have a Sabbath day anymore. Yeah. We don't have the ceremonial laws. We don't have Sabbath days and therefore we don't need to meet. And what the writer of the Hebrews is saying is you're missing the principle attached to the third commandment of being with God's people in God's word. You Mm -hmm. still need to do that. And then, so what you see here then is that there are applications, specific applications attached to the commandments for God's people at that time, but there's a bigger principle that we still need to reapply to ourselves today. So another one, the next commandment is honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Anybody who thinks that that commandment is only about children to parents isn't getting the spirit of the commandments. Mm-hmm. Because when you grow up, it's, the whole spirit of it is honoring your authorities. Mm-hmm. When you grow up, you have still have authorities, you just have different authorities. Like your parents are no longer your physical and spiritual authority, which they are when you're a kid. But you still have a physical authority, it's your governing authorities, and you still have a spiritual authority, it's your church authorities. Mm -hmm. So you still have a, so the fourth commandment's principle is respect your authorities. It's not just respect your parents, although they are an example or a specific application of that. Mm -hmm. Same is true when you get to, um, you know, the sixth commandment talks about adultery. Does that mean that, okay, people, I literally have had Christians ask me this before, Okay, so there's a commandment about adultery, but it doesn't say anything about premarital sex. Mm-hmm. So does that mean so long as I don't get married, I can have sex with whomever I, I want? No. That is the that is one... It's The principle is sexual immorality. Mm-hmm. An application of that principle would be don't have sex with somebody who's not your, uh, your spouse. Mm-hmm. But see, all the Israelites, by and large, were married. Like, that was just part of their culture. They didn't have a bunch of singles mm-hmm. walking around. So the concept of extra or premarital sex almost like didn't exist. Uh, people got stoned for that under Israelite law. So you have to 
my point is you have to distill what is the principle attached mm -hmm. to those laws and then flesh out how does it apply in my specific life circumstance. What's my favorite one? Your specific favorite one? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I know which command is your favorite command. No, my favorite explanation. Oh, explanation. Go ahead. I don't know. To the whatever number commandment, do not lie. Mm -hmm. but the explanation is, there's more to the explanation than this, but to take people's words and actions in the kindest way possible. Ah, uh, yes. So I, tell my, I have to tell myself this all the time. I literally just texted that phrase to a friend and I said, I wish, so -so, I wish people would just take everyone's words and actions in the kindest way possible. Like clearly there was no malicious aforethought for yeah. like that action. And not only do I wish other people did it, but I have to remind myself to do it all the time because I think I'm very quick to, like, not take offense, but get annoyed. I'm like, mm. like, there's really nothing. Just take it in the kindest way possible. If someone, you know, I have a friend who's awesome at like underhanded compliments or bragging about themselves. I'm sure, like, you no. just, I just gotta take it in. They don't mean it like that. Yep. Yeah, I know this person. Just take it in the kindest way possible. Yes, looking for the constructively at things, not destructively and cynically at everything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's good. So what you're talking about, uh, Luther's explanation of the commandments, which you know I was forced to memorize as a kid and whatever, and probably didn't like it at the time. But uh, what I've come to learn is that really anybody who studies the commandments in any kind of detail today studies Luther. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, you know, always a Luther apologist on everything, but like very clearly here, it doesn't matter which denominational background you work on. Everybody, the concepts of like vocation, uh, the concepts mm -hmm. of the commandments, like you can't say that you've studied it well unless you've studied Luther. Yeah, I'd and, actually like to read through it in more in depth when I have time to read things again. Yeah. But this was one of the, I'm pretty sure when we were dating, James gave me for Christmas a copy of Luther's. The Blue Catechism, yeah. Yeah, did. thanks. Luther's Catechism. Amongst many other great presents. Very it wasn't romantic. exclusively like I'm in pretty 2009 sure I, never read it until I got a catechism. 10 years later. Well, but that, that explanation, um, so like it's to the sin of lying, mm -hmm. right? So what we would number the eighth commandment, you should not bear false witness against your neighbor. But that is, so again, what Luther is doing there is he's saying, what's the principle here? The principle is not, it, like the a lying is an application. It's one sin that you can commit with your mouths. It's mm -hmm. one sin that you can commit in communication. But guess what? You can tell the truth and be sinning. Gossiping is sinning. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're t speaking truth, but you're using it to hurt other people mm -hmm. and ruin their reputations, that's wrong. And Luther got that. So if somebody like says, well, there's no commandment against gossiping, you're not, you're not understanding the principle of the Eighth Commandment. Mm -hmm. It's to use words constructively, not destructively. And for that matter, Luther takes it a step further and says, it's to interpret other people's words constructively, mm -hmm. not destructively, which is a fantastic explanation. Uh, take their words and actions in the kindest possible way. All of that is packed into the spirit of what God is designing you know, here in the command, in each of the commandments. And so make sure to not just, uh, like, yes, you take them literally and you understand the application as one application for the Israelites, but back up a little bit and see the macro, uh, the principle attached to each of these. Mm -hmm. um, all right, devotional thought number three, the structure of the commandments. This is one thing I don't think I've ever heard anybody else point this out. So I don't want to take too much credit. And it also, the moment you take credit for something, it puts you really out there for criticism on things too. But uh, understanding the way, um, a little bit about the way things are recorded in the Bible and the prominence, even in <laughs> like Hebrew and Greek language regarding the first and last things recorded in a word or the way things are structured in a, you know, whatever. I think that their God is very intentionally because everybody would notice is the first commandment and the last of the commandments, however you number them, mm -hmm. the covet one or ones about coveting mm -hmm. are unique versus the other ones. And so the first of the commandments, which is not just one amongst many, but is an overarching commandment is about idolatry. You shall have no other gods. And he even says before me, and that word before can be translated either before or besides. I like before simply from the standpoint that it also indicates priority because mm -hmm. idols, generally speaking, are not inherently bad things. Like it's not just like 
drugs and violence and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It's, it can be like the best things in our lives. It's the things that we look to give us identity, meaning, purpose, hope, security. Uh, so oftentimes they're like the beautiful things, the gifts of God, but we're loving the, the blessings ahead of the blesser kind of thing and the created things more than the creator God. And so the first commandment is prioritize your heart. Mm -hmm. Don't love any of God's good gifts more than you love God himself. And so you shall have no gods before me. Nothing goes ahead of me. Nothing, you know. The last of the commandments is about coveting, which is internal desires. And again, we don't use that word in modern Western civilization because modern Western people don't believe your desires can ever be wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we literally don't even have a word. I mean, it exists in our English vocabulary, but nobody uses it. Mm -hmm. in the 21st century because 21st century people don't think that your desires are wrong at all and that's one of the reasons why we're so polarized it's one of the reasons why we can't communicate with one another because we don't actually even have literally the vocabulary to, to explain how corrupt our hearts are I actually think some people think that coveting can motivate you correct so people that are like selling fitness programs or anything like hey i'm gonna post this image of myself maybe if you think it looks good you will want that and purchase yep. this product yeah it's talked a lot recently in a couple different discussions about marketing and um that kind of thing that you're talking about i think we have uh i have oh. uh marketing in the 20 marketing today like so sales is one thing and can you yes like you have to tout the benefits of your product mm -hmm. Uh, but intentionally, like psychologically manipulating people to create a void in their life and suggesting that your product is the pseudo messiah that'll solve all their problems, mm -hmm. that would be sinful. And like that is a massive temptation in a capitalist free market society where it's essentially just kind of a survival of the fittest. Um, yes, there are a thousand different products out there, but here's, I'm going to, I almost have to lie to you or manipulate you in, in order to convince you to take mine and mm -hmm. see that's better than the other 999. And so, but yeah, that it all plays into this whole coveting desire concept, manipulating people psychologically so that they desire, because everybody does have a Christ sized hole in their life mm -hmm. and they're just grabbing at things, trying to throw them in there to make themselves not feel so empty and mm -hmm. you know life feels so meaningless and so like being careful with that but the the but to your point um it does explain if you understand coveting it explains so much of the behavior mm -hmm. that you see that exists in like america today anyways the first of the commandments is you shall not uh have no other gods nothing before me the last of the commandments is don't desire anything as though it were god and every like that's what covering is an inappropriate mm -hmm. unhealthy desire for something that you think will give you what only God can give you the interesting thing is every commandment in between is essentially a form of worship to your false gods mm -hmm. so I've, I mean and I think I've touched on this a little bit before but if um, pleasure it, 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 let's start here if freedom is an idol for you like I'm gonna do what I want to do when I want to do it that kind of autonomy you're never gonna respect your authorities mm -hmm. because you're the only authority in your life. So you're not gonna obey the fourth commandment. You're worshiping your, your false God of freedom. If uh, pleasure is an idol to you, you're probably not gonna obey the sixth commandment about sexual immorality because you know my body is my own and do with as I please. And so long as it creates happiness for me and it's consensual and it's whatever, um, I can do whatever I want with my body uh, because it gives me pleasure. And so you're gonna break the God's, the real God's command about the design for sexuality. Um, if money is an idol to you, you're probably going to break the real God's commandment about uh, the seventh commandment about stealing. You say, well, I don't take anything from whatever. Like, I mean, w when people are dishonest in marketing, when people cheat on their taxes, when people, uh, yeah, upsell or upsell mm -hmm. people's stuff that they don't actually people need. People don't give to God what's God's. Exactly. Well, you're robbing from God. Um, like totally, you're going to break the real God's seventh commandment if money's an idol to you at all. If uh, a status, the eighth commandment, if, if your status is a um, idol to you, your mm -hmm. reputation, you're going to break the, the real God's eighth commandment because you're going to tear other people down because you think by comparison, if they look worse, you'll look better. Mm -hmm. And so like you worship your false gods. First commandment is you shall have no other gods. The last commandment is you should not desire anything in your heart as though it were God. Get control on that. Repent of what's in your heart. Because if you don't, 
you're going to break the real God's commandments in between uh, in order to serve and worship your false God. Mm-hmm. In other words, people are erecting and bowing down to just as many uh, idol altars today as they were back then. They look regressive to us, but we don't see it in ourselves today. So your original thought was that the... What I'm saying I hadn't read from somebody else? Yeah. Yeah, is I hadn't... I've never heard somebody explain how the commandments were bookended like that. Mm -hmm. Because I I always knew coveting is unique to the second table... In the second table of the law. You Mm -hmm. compare coveting, which is very clearly an internal thing, to stealing, murder, sexual immorality. There's something unique about it. But when actually I was doing some study of the, how different groups in their backgrounds number the commandments, mm-hmm. what I came to is like, okay, it doesn't matter as much how they're numbered. The, what's really important is what's at the beginning and what's at mm-hmm. the end. And you get bookends to, um, it's bookends to the story of the idolatry. Yeah. You know. How do you diagnose your idols? Um, how do you diagnose them is a good question. What I do with people when I'm working with them in counseling mm-hmm. is I have a series of about... I know you have a formula. A dozen questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Give us three good ones. Okay. So I ask people, uh, what is the thing... Fill in the blank. What is the thing in your life that you'd say, if I could only have blank, I would finally be happy. Mm-hmm. I would finally actually be happy. And uh, if your answer to that blank is something other than Jesus Christ it's got idolatrous power in your life. For that matter, the flip side of that question is, if I lost Mm -hmm. blank in my life, I don't think my life would even be worth living. Whatever that is in that blank, if it's something other than Jesus Christ, it's got idolatrous power in your life. Other things, other questions would be like, uh, yeah, when I wake up in the morning, the first thing that I'm always thinking about is this. Mm -hmm. Or when I go to bed at night, the last thing that I'm always thinking about is this. Or... Uh, the things in my life that I can give time and money and energy um, without hesitation to. Yeah. You know, like, th- what is that? You're sa- you sa- those are sacrifices. If you did it for something you didn't like, you would say, man, those are big sacrifices. I don't know if I can make that sacrifice. When you do it so freely for something, mm-hmm. um, what is that? That's an offering to your God. Mm-hmm. So, like, those are the types of things. And, uh, like I said, I have usually a battery of about... 12 questions that I'll walk people through to get them mm-hmm. to self-identify. Yeah. I've thrown a lot of money at things I thought would make me look better. Yeah. In some way, shape, or form. Well, what does that tell you? Mm-hmm. You probably have some kind of... I mean, this is going to sound... It's not, I know it sounds crazy to some people, but um, to put it in spiritual some terms, we're, we're fighting parents. against the spiritual forces that exist in this world. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, and therefore... Perhaps there is some demonic force out there that has convinced you Mm -hmm. that your entire net value is wrapped up in physical appearance. I've even said before, if I was disfigured, I would just rather die. Mm -hmm. Whereas I've lived with many uh, arguable disfigurements (laughs) as the years have gone on. No, I'm kind of kidding. Uh, But the... I mean, I think for somebody who is physically attractive, I, the interesting thing is I think that how that can become an idol, whereas somebody else who, I mean, I'm sure it can become an idol for anybody. Mm-hmm. Any, that's the thing is any good yeah. thing can become an idol. Yeah. It differs from one person to the next. Um, but from your career to your family to your kids to mm-hmm. the concept of a kid, um, I get, man, I get that your one husband. all the time that this just ru- ru- rules my life. Oh, yeah. Uh, romantic love or uh, success in my career or like, and it's just like all consuming. It's all the person thinks about. Mm-hmm. And they would give literally anything. Yeah, they would They would either rather die if they couldn't have it or they would empty their bank account if they could have it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what is that? That is idolatrous power, you know. So you have to be able to reach some level of spiritual maturity. You have to be able to identify and repent of your idols and... Um, the people that um, aren't it, like idolatry gives you vocabulary to figure out why you do what you do and why you love what you love. And if you are a Christian, but you're not able to identify idols, mm-hmm. um, it's a huge hindrance to developing maturity. Mm-hmm. So. All right, let's close with the prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the opportunity again to study specifically your commands today. Uh, it's always enlightening to be able to directly 
apply and identify the things in our lives that are competing for priority in our hearts. And everybody's got something, and most of us have different things from one person to the next, and yet Satan doesn't care what those things are. He just wants it to be anything but Jesus. Um, and so we ask that you would give us a clarity and a sobriety so that uh, we can see those lies and those sales pitches for what they are, and uh, that we would actually uh, go through the spiritual disciplines in such a way that always seeks to glorify Jesus first, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and trust that everything else in life takes care of itself. Uh, forgive us for our daily failures to do that, but uh, create in us new hearts that uh, only seek you each day. May it be to your glory. Amen. Thank you for your insight and knowledge on idols. <laughs> Are you saying that because I got a bad review on a on a, something else that I wrote on idols? No. No, no I'm just thanking you. That's just the way I talk. It sounds insincere, but it's not. Oh, yeah. No, I, I won't even get into that. So... Uh, that other thing. So, um, people online are so fun. People in life are so fun. Yes. Comments. I have somebody, by the way, somebody following this study, I think I've mentioned this to you. There's at least one person who is following seemingly everything I do online. And unless there's just one random person each time that's giving me a thumbs down on everything. But like, <laughs> just if, one thumbs down. Yeah. Like there's, there's, yeah. Like I, that's, I average at least a good thumbs down on everything I do. But that's fine. there's either that or there's like one person or a demon that is going af after me <laughs> Man, everywhere I, would love I go. I it was a demon. Like you have got to be kidding me. How is this even Can like. Can they operate keyboards? I don't believe so. But uh, yeah, that just thumbs down every single thing. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Uh, they will do it. And so, you know, it just is what it is. Well, and if you, you had no critics, you, can't you wouldn't get... be doing something right. Right. Yeah, this is true. Uh, as Christians, we put ourselves out there as vulnerably, as humbly, as honestly as we can. And um, God will take care of the rest. And yeah, if nobody's ever fighting against you, then Satan doesn't feel like you're accomplishing anything or threatening anything so thank you lord for keeping us humble all right so uh see you tomorrow blessings and we will see you tomorrow for exodus 21 salutations